brethren, please open your Bibles with me again to Isaiah chapter 5. The blessed prophet Isaiah. Chapter 5. Again, we're only going to read one verse for time's sake. you please stand with me as we read the Word of God? That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In fact, let's read verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Amen. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His inspired and infallible and preserved Word. Father in heaven, we praise and thank Thee for the infinite mercies Thou hast poured out upon us in Jesus Christ the Lord. Now as we take up this this difficult subject, once again, I pray with all of my heart that Thou wouldst teach us. Teach us, Lord. Help me to speak to Thy people in a way that brings Thee glory, that will do them good. And we ask it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The Bible begins with a very simple few words in the beginning God in the beginning God that's the introduction to the 66 books that we now have and they're among the most important verses in the holy word of God we don't have time to enumerate as many as we might but there are great reasons for us to dwell on those words I, the first one that I would set before you is this. The God who made the heavens and the earth reveals himself. That's vital. As Moses wrote these books, the first five books of the Bible that we refer to as the Pentateuch, <clears throat> he was telling the Jews who they were. They did not live in a day of mass media like we do. Uh, many of us here have, have grown up and don't know what it's like being in a world where word of mouth is all that you have. That, that's so foreign, we can't even imagine it. But God revealed himself. He set his truth before his people. He revealed that He is the creator of heaven and earth. He doesn't tell us how. He simply shows us that He speaks. He is a God that has all power. He conceives, He speaks, and things come into existence that never were. This mighty God the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all human beings, the one who sustains it now, reveals himself as holy. He reveals himself as righteous. And we want to understand just a little bit about that. This God of the Bible, this God who created the heavens and the earth, this spectacular work that caused the angels to shout out as they saw the glory of His manifest power. This God says that He's holy. This means that He's set apart from all that is wicked, everything that is against, hostile to, violent toward His character. Everything that does not measure up 
to who and what He is, having made us. He is set apart from all that is wicked. He is set apart unto all things that are good and pure, because He is good and pure. His very essence is holy. He is the definition, He is the measuring rod of what good means. Something that is good is God-like. The Jews understood this. Chapter 1 of Genesis is very important because God spoke, things came into existence, and He declared them good. Well, what does that mean? Well, it, it doesn't mean some strange measure or standard that was just floating around out there called good. What it means is it reflects Him. It reflects His glory, His infinite genius. From the tiniest micro dots of things in existence to the expanse of heaven, we see a mind and a power that is good, that is great, that is awesome. He is set apart from everything that is foul, hurtful, hateful, wicked. And he reflects what is right and good. This God called a people out of darkness. He made a nation called Israel. He delivered them from bondage in Egypt. And then he took them out into the wilderness, and there was a glorious marriage from Mount Sinai. He, the living God, entered into a wedding vow with His bride, the people that He had delivered. He gave them His law, His Ten Commandments. These were the wedding vows. Here's the agreement. I'm your God. You're my people. You won't have any other gods. You won't make any images and bow down and worship them. You won't take my holy name in vain. You won't treat it like it's useless, worthless, cheap. And all of these wonderful laws speak of His glorious, holy, and good character. Now, what does that have to do with our subject? Everything. What was Israel supposed to do? Israel, as the delivered ones, the, the nation that God loved above everyone else, they were to reflect to the world God's goodness, God's holiness. And how were they to do that? By keeping His law. By keeping His law. When they would walk in what He commanded, the world would see what human beings were supposed to be. They would see how they were supposed to live. They would reflect his goodness in the way they treated one another, in the way they would work through problems, in, in applying His glorious laws to the way they lived as men and women, husbands, wives, parents, and children. That would speak as the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, His people much more. Because the heavens are not made in His image. They simply reflect His greatness and goodness. We are image bearers of the Almighty. Therefore, Israel was to be a shining light to the world. Because whatever they did, they were to be submitted in thought and word and deed to the law of God. That law was good, 
And when they obeyed it, they were good. They at least reflected goodness. It's amazing to me. Again, the, the theological tradition that I was brought up in simply makes the law all about externals. When all through the Old Testament, it is clear that great men of God talk about the law being in our hearts. Thou desirest truth in the inward part, David prays in Psalm 51. Well, what's that truth? It isn't something that just kind of falls off of a tree into your heart. It's not something that you inject. It's when the word of God, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Does this make sense? Well then, with that in mind, we want to take up our subject. We come back to God's view of same-sex practice. And tonight, we take up part two of Objection 6. And that Objection 6 is you folks that disagree with the LGBT movement and what they call marriage equality and the arguments that they're making for virtually every sexual perversion that you can possibly imagine. Is in, in their mind, they would say to us, we're on the wrong side of history. For us to stand and say, no, my friend, you are made in God's image, and the lifestyle you have chosen violates his law. You are therefore not good. What you are doing is not good. It doesn't reflect what God has commanded. They would say we're on the wrong side of history. I understand what they mean by that. We discussed that in our last time together on this subject. But there's a bigger picture than history itself. And I would set before you is that those who think that way are on the wrong side of God because they are in fact calling Evil, as defined by the Word of God, good. This is what Isaiah the prophet, as God's mouthpiece, is rebuking Israel for. They are now living like the nations around them. They are breaking the covenant laws. Therefore, their lives are not good. Their lives, what they're saying, what they're doing, are not good because they're not in harmony with God's good law. And they are now then pronouncing things that they know God has forbidden to be something we can do and we call evil good and good evil. What they are calling as being on the right side of history is calling evil good. And they are on the wrong side of God. So, <clears throat> We want to continue where we left off last time. <clears throat> we eventually want to get to the modern movement, but we want to understand something about how that has come to pass in history. Because far too many believers, having been utterly separated from this issue, having 
not even read any good Christian books about the subject, have no idea why all of a sudden they're facing something that seems so very alien to them. At least there are some believers like that. Those that spend their time in front of Hollywood very often have been introduced to it. You can't watch television or watch any of the latest movies coming out of uh, that tragic place without being informed that a lifestyle of perversion is fine. It's good. It's okay. But what you are seeing before you, including the the decision last year regarding what they call marriage equality, and all of this has been something that's been coming for a long time. And we want to understand that better so that we understand our world better so that we may speak of Christ and live for Christ more effectively. So we want to consider then same-sex practice in the ancient world. We've spent a good bit of time looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament passages that speak about God's view of same-sex practice. I said at the very beginning of this series, I had chosen God's view of same-sex practice as a title for this series quite specifically because, <clears throat> as we will see, some of the terms that we use today are not terms that we find in the Bible. They're not terms that have come to us by the Word of God, but from psychology and other things. As people have attempted to take various practices and bring them under the umbrella of an identity. So, let's consider first the early biblical world. <clears throat> In our previous message, we considered very briefly that same-sex practice arises as early as Genesis 19 in the Word of God. We see it in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God forbade same-sex practice in the Levitical Holiness Code. That's a very important code. There are references to it all through the New Testament. Paul's mind is saturated with this thing. He doesn't he doesn't regularly quote it, but he's constantly making references that clearly arise from the holiness code that he knew as a Jew. Things that God had said were good and evil. <clears throat> and the Leviticus, uh, the, the Levitical code in uh, chapter 18, verses, um, verse 22, and chapter 20, verse 13, very clearly forbid same-sex practice. It doesn't say homosexuality. As plain as it can be without being morbidly graphic, it simply tells us, a man shall not lie with a male as he does with a woman. That is an abomination to God that's what he says. People today hate to hear that word abomination connected to this subject. But I didn't write the Bible. God himself says, this is an abomination to me. It's not good. There are a lot of other things that are abominations as well. <clears throat> now, it's quite... It, 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 uh, same-sex practice, practice sadly appears in the Promised Land in Judges 19 and in 1 Kings 14.24. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now, brethren, very often we read this and we just go right over it. We, we don't understand the depths of what's being said here. God's covenanted people, 
God's bride, God's wife. Israel has taken vows to be faithful to him. When it says there are sodomites in the land, they're living in direct contradiction to the Levitical code and to God's purpose in Genesis 1 where he tells us that he created male and female in his image. There were sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations. How did that happen? They began to see evil as acceptable, evil as good. And they began to cast off what God had commanded. They were calling good evil. When Josiah began his reform, he break down the house, houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. What a blasphemous offense to God. But that's how far they had fallen. He break down the houses of the Sodomites. And these usually were temple prostitutes. In other words, there was much about foreign religion, idolatrous religion, that they liked. It was sensual. It wasn't like having to bring one of your, your goats or your kids and cutting its kids, children, I mean by goats and sheep, and cutting their throat and, and pouring their blood out. What a bloody religion. That part of worship? Yes, absolutely, it was. Well, sensual pleasures are more enjoyable than that. They liked the way that religion went. What are we talking about? Not simply a sexual act, but a swap of religious worldviews. And that's what we're seeing in this country right now. You can barely distinguish what's called a worship service today from a rock concert that you can walk into any place, in any bar, or in any big coliseum around this world. You cannot distinguish, except maybe we get some Jesus lyrics. And all of a sudden, sensuality, both in the music and in the dress or lack thereof. Brethren, when we don't like God's strictness, we'll begin to call evil good and good evil. That's what was happening in Israel. How did Josiah reform? He changed the worship. He broke down the houses of the Sodomites, which included their ways of worship. Second Kings 23.7, same-sex practice was forbidden and severely judged by the Lord. In Revelation 22.15, John writes in his vision of the new Jerusalem, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Well, now, when we look at this list, one thing sticks out very obviously. We understand the term whoremongers and sorcerers and murderers. How did dogs get in there? Well, number one, you've... you've Learned this before. Don't want to offend our dog owners and lovers. The scriptures never speak of dogs in a good way. Never. 
never. And they are often used in Scripture as an example of what's wrong with people. The word dogs obviously points to wicked people. Well, why are they being called dogs? It, it, they're not being called they're not being called giraffes. They're not being called sharks. They're not being called any number of animals. Why dogs? Well, there's a lot of commentary ink spilled on that. It's obviously pointing to, to wicked people. <clears throat> Some would say it's kind of like the umbrella term, dogs, and then that means sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever lies. Now this is very important. <clears throat> when it says for without, that means excluded from the holy city. Excluded from everlasting life. In the scriptures, Jewish false teachers, Gentiles, and unbelievers are sometimes called dogs for various reasons. Dogs return to and eat their own vomit. The first time the dog I owned did that, I simply was shocked beyond words. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I thought I had a desperately demented dog. And then I found out that that was actually in Scripture. It's a foul and unclean practice. Dogs have several practices that are unclean. And they ran in packs. They could devour people. Mm. No, they were not used in the sense of the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's a nobility there, a majesty. <clears throat> now, commentator David Aune points out, dog and perhaps the fornicators as well, is used more specifically here for male homosexuals, pederasts, or sodomites, since the term on the parallel vice list in chapter 21, verse 8, is those who are polluted. This is connected to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 17 and 18. There shall, listen to the parallelism in this, there shall not, <clears throat> excuse me, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Harlot, whore, sodomite. Thou shalt not bring the higher of a whore or the price of a dog here dog and sodomite are parallel in in the two passages set before us you will not bring that into the house of the lord thy god for any vow if that's how you've earned it don't bring it to god's temple For even both these are, and here's that word, abominations to the Lord. Now, let me, let me say quickly, not all commentators make this connection, and I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. But I think that there are very good contextual reasons for taking that understanding. Either way... Again, we see the connection <clears throat> between 
uh, in, in the Deuteronomy passage, we see the connection between abomination and same-sex practice. Whether that's what's being referred to in Revelation or not, it's very plainly the meaning of Deuteronomy chapter 23. Abomination and being a sodomite. While the context, I think, seems to point to those in, who engage in same-sex practice, whether or no that is the case, we have numerous other passages in the scripture that prohibit that practice. So the early biblical world was clear and specific. God told us about manhood, womanhood, and his law preserves it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That is for the purpose of preserving the man and woman relationship. God made husbands and wives, male and females. It is together in their difference that they bring glory to God. And every sexual sin is a violation of God's purpose for marriage. And it doesn't matter at this point, which one it is, there are numerous ones, including pornography. These are vital violations against what is good. In one sense, every sexual sin is perversion because it is not treating marriage the way God intended it to exist, to be expressed. So let's consider Greek culture. Let's move on from the Hebrews for a moment. We have the Levitical Code. We have the, the, the numerous passages that, that mention sodomites and the various places that these things appear. This is not something that Scripture takes a lot of time on, but it's something that Scripture makes very clear. Well, Greek culture has left an indelible mark on the history of the West. The achievements of the Greeks in literature, and art, and math, and philosophy, and architecture still influence Western civilization today. And along with these achievements, Ancient Greeks seem to have engaged in same-sex practice more widely than any other ancient people. At least, that's what we seem to learn from history at this point. Once again, not a point uh, to be dogmatic about, but as far as the men that I'm reading who are homosexual scholars themselves are saying that Greece is like the high watermark for same-sex practice. <clears throat> However, the Greek language did not have a specific word for it. Thomas Hubbard in Homosexuality in Greece and Rome says this, the term homosexuality is itself problematic when applied to ancient cultures. That's an important distinction. When applied to ancient cultures. We'll see, God willing, either the next time or the time after, exactly where that term came from. But it's modern, 1869, by the way. <clears throat> so, um, Hubbard goes on to say, inasmuch as neither Greek nor Latin possesses any one word covering the same semantic range as the modern concept. Close quote. As we will see, uh, the word homosexuality simply didn't exist. It was not something in any language until 1869. And its home, the nation of its origin, was Germany. Now more on that later. Well, Lewis Crompton, himself a homosexual scholar, echoes Hubbard's thought in his book, Homosexuality and Civilization. Quote, the ancient Greeks had no word that corresponded to our word homosexuality. 
Piderastia, the closest they came to it, meant literally boy love. That is, a relation between an older male and someone younger, close quote. Crompton also said Greek religion, quote, Greek religion, too, testifies to the hold, to the hold pederasty had upon the Greek imagination, close quote. Now, brethren, I do not wish to be unseemly, and I will not be graphic, but I am telling you, if you're not reading and following some of what's happening in your world and your culture, pedophilia is big in this country. There is the return to this wickedness. It is something they want legalized. It is calling evil good. Now, these are not pleasant thoughts, but this is precisely why God gave laws regarding them. Because this is where the heart separated from him goes. I'm not saying every lost person would engage in pedophilia, but I'm saying this is one of the expressions of a heart separated from God's world. It has always been connected to pagan religions. Not that every pagan religion promotes it, but this never arose from the law of God. <clears throat> now, as we've previously seen, God utterly forbids this practice in the book of Leviticus. If a man also lie with mankind, meaning if a man lies with a male, no age on that, just if a man lies with a male, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. There's the word. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This, this required the death penalty. But you know, one of the reasons we don't take that seriously, and I'm not, I'm not advocating a return to this in our law, but what I'm saying to you is one of the reasons we don't take that seriously today is because the same death penalty is put on adultery and we've made adultery okay. Same thing with fornication, certain acts of fornication, not all acts of fornication. But rape was given the death penalty. We wouldn't see so much of it if that were a law. This, this is what God gave his people. Was he being mean? No, he was preserving them because all people are his image bearers. These things are destructive to our lives, to the lives of others. I am not, again, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we should put all of the Levitical laws into our law structure, but it's quite clear that we need to understand that God gave these laws. He put very serious very, very serious penalties on them because they're not good. According to him, who is the good? <laughs> Colin Spencer tells us in Homosexuality in History, quote, in Crete, goddess worship probably lasted longer than anywhere else. Probably one of the reasons we have one of the apostles' letters to that place. The gospel got into a place where goddess worship lasted almost longer than any other place in the Greco-Roman Empire. Now that's further down the road historically, that's under Rome. We're still talking about ancient Greece, but ancient Greece in Crete certainly had goddess worship very early. Minoan wall paintings of men wearing women's clothes indicate that a cult of male prostitution was also practiced. That is generally the idea behind the word sodomite where it appears in the Old Testament because it was connected with idol worship. But what was in the middle 
what was going on in that idol worship, same-sex practice. It wasn't simply that it was connected to idolatry, as we've talked about before, that it was wrong. The act itself was wrong, and it reflected the false gods that it was connected to. It is interesting, then, that from this island, Crete, we also have an account of the seduction of boys a social convention of the time, close quote. This is, these are not the writings of Christian men. Th these are homosexual scholars writing about the history of, of homosexuality, of same-sex practice. And I trust that I'm quoting them all in context. I do not wish to misquote any of them. I don't like being misquoted and I don't want to misquote them. Now this is, the, 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 the quote that we've just read, is one of the reasons God's Word says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination to the Lord. Abomination unto the Lord thy God. What we, may, what we wear matters. And we, we can be called legalists and all of that stuff, but I'm telling you, God says some very specific things about men and women and their adornment. And it must clearly distinguish men and women in a modest way. We can, we can make sure that they're distinguished, but they can be mighty immodest. Well, the point is to see both of those things. Now, lesbianism and bisexuality were commonly practiced in Greek culture as well. The Illustrated Bible Backgrounds commentary says, quote, the, the poetess Sappho from the Aegean island of Lesbos, from which we get the name lesbianism, celebrated the beauty of her female students. Although Plato regarded homosexuality as unnatural, intellectuals like Sophocles and Socrates had male lovers even in old age. Close quote. This was their life. This was not something they thought was wrong. They thought it was good. And God had given his people that says, not good. The great tragedy of Isaiah 5 is that over and again, God's people were wanting to live like the world around them, and they began to call good evil and evil good. Again, what we are ultimately talking about here is sexuality according to God versus sexuality according to pagan religion. It is ultimately connected to your worldview, which means that at the very bottom of it, it is connected to your religion, whatever your religion is, even if it's the religion of atheism. Worldview attempts to answer the big questions of life. And ultimately, we have to explain why we believe there's such a thing as good or evil. Well, the Christian can say because God has revealed himself. In the beginning, God. And that God has revealed himself throughout history through his faithful servants, through his prophets, and through his word. Most of all, through his holy son, the incarnate word. Well, my brethren, <clears throat> this is why Paul could write to those living in a Greco-Roman culture, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. That's what was happening on Lesbos. 
And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is good? No, unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meet or which was fitting. Romans 1, 26 and 27. <clears throat> Do you see the contrast? Can you see that between the Hebrews and, of course, later Christians when they had the New Testament, God has given us a very clear, very clear standard of how men and women are to relate. And the wrong worldview, the wrong God, will lead you into a view of male and femaleness that is in error. It won't be good. Let's consider Roman culture quickly, and then we will bring this to a close this evening. When the mighty Roman armies encountered Greek culture, they also encountered Greek same-sex practice. There are those who would say, Rome con conquered Greece, and then Greece conquered Rome with its ideas and with its culture. <clears throat> While Greece thought that the man-boy relationships were good, they were regularly practiced, it was considered a normal part of day-to-day of -day life. Uh, a man would take a, young, a younger man and he would mentor him and they would have this relationship that the Word of God says was an abomination. It was the air they breathed. It was expected of boys then to grow up and do the same with young men when they were older. This was their culture. It's what they lived in. We, you wouldn't be able to say to them, um, oh, are you committing homosexuality? They would have no idea what you're talking about. It is simply a sexual practice in their world as they understand it. And as I said, the Greeks thought that this was good. These relationships were good. They thought that they were important. And they thought that they were loving relationships. And they fully intended for those young men then to grow up and to get married and to have legitimate children. But as they would get older, they would initiate another young man in these things. Rome didn't like that. Very interesting. Rome was a little rougher. <laughs> Rome wasn't quite as smoothed out and philosophical as Greece. It's one of the reasons it was easily taken over later. <clears throat> they, the Roman boys were brought up that they were going to be warriors that would conquer the world. That's how they were brought up. It wasn't like, oh yeah, here, play your little game. I mean, even they had a better idea of bringing up boys than many of us dare to do. Yeah, spend your life here in front of the television, son, as it makes you an idiot. <sighs> Unbelievable. No, they thought, wait a minute, we're bringing our sons up to be warriors. We're bringing them up to conquer by their strength, to conquer by their minds, and to conquer by the power of their nation. So they didn't like the idea of, of their boys being in these practices. But they weren't against that practice with slaves. They didn't like freeborn boys being in a passive role, which means that they were feminized and humiliated because they brought them up to be strong and to be leaders and to be men, not like women. What does the law of God say? lying with a man as with a woman. Amazingly that the pagan, uh, amazing that the pagan Rome, Romans did not buy that. Not with freeborn boys, but slaves, unfortunately, they did. <clears throat> so they did not like this idea, and they actually eventually began to make laws against older men and boys. 
but that took a process of development and evolution. <clears throat> While this practice was against Roman law, some still pursued it. We're not surprised at that. We all know what the speed limit sign says, right? <clears throat> Don't walk on the grass. Yeah, well, maybe today. So, <clears throat> this all of this is 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 documented. Uh, it's documented in poems. It's documented in plays. It's documented in histories, and it's found in the works of of men such as. Uh, Hubbard's Homosexuality in Greece and Rome, Spencer's Homosexuality in History, Crompton's Homosexuality in Civilization. Bisexuality was not uncommon, and same-sex prostitution, the Sodomites, the temple prostitutes, <clears throat> was tolerated. This was tolerated by Rome. It seems that in the second century B.C., Roman culture inherited widespread homosexuality from Greece. In those days, very often, men went out to war, and they were gone a long time. And being with men, and bunking with men, and living, and dying, and fighting along with men, they bonded in ways that sometimes over long periods of time, especially when they were excluded from the presence of women, became sinful relationships. Still happens today in our own armed forces. <clears throat> James de Young says, quote, it occurred in all forms, same-sex practice, in all forms, pederasty, male prostitution, mercenary, catamites, that's the, passenera, that's the passive partner, adult mutuality, and lesbianism. The Romans fashioned several law codes over several centuries to legislate homosexuality in various ways. The Romans really struggled over this. They caved in from time to time. But they, they really, they could see a problem somehow that the Greeks didn't, but they would cave in time and again to this thing. Why? Because they were separated from the true God. That's why any of us sin. Nevertheless, several Roman law codes eventually appeared that prohibited same-sex practice and even called for the death penalty. Amazing for a pagan nation. Well, let's stop right there and, and just consider a couple of things. Why do we take the time <clears throat> to look at, look at the Bible and, and what it says in our earlier sessions and then tonight do kind of a quick recap and, and, and look at ancient Hebrews and, and its civilization and what God says about these things and Greek culture and Roman culture. It was because the God who made the heavens and the earth revealed himself to his people and gave them his laws. He covenanted with them, and when they walked according to his good laws, they brought him glory, and they showed the world that lived in darkness God's goodness, especially in their relationship between men and women. God's word made the Jews stick out. They were different. They were not doing, or they weren't supposed to do, what all the pagan nations did. And that's why Isaiah 5 is so sad. They had been given the goodness of God. They'd been delivered from slavery, from idolatrous Egypt. You read about Egypt's religion. Wow. That's another mind bender. But I will tell you without any hesitation, those faithful Jews that trusted their God and walked according to God's law reflected his great glory to that lost world. Israel was his witness to the world and his laws showed forth his purity, his righteousness, his goodness. And the nations sunk down continued sinking down in their darkness. So what a great tragedy when all of a sudden God's professing people are living like the world around them, calling evil good and good evil. We will 
take up next time the development of the idea of homosexuality. Yes, there was same-sex practice going back to the earliest of biblical times. But what we now see as a movement that has gained political power, actually, uh, the, the, all of these practices took place in almost every single culture. And very often, it was no one had a problem with it. In some societies, they did, but in others, they didn't. But finally, <clears throat> when we begin to consider this, in history, there was no movement. It was just people following out their lusts. They weren't getting together and saying, this is our identity, this is who we are. They didn't think in those terms. They followed their practice. The modern movement began in Germany. And what you've seen today has been evolving from the, the, pa the, the, the practices that have been there in history. All of a sudden, they began to congeal. They began to come together. They began to say, wait a minute, this is a group of people with an identity, and they do certain things because they are something. And then we have to have psychological terms and medical names for it. Out of that, we got homosexuality. Not the practice, the term. So that being the case, my dear brethren, here's what we close with. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, came into this world to show us what the law of God really looks like lived out day by day. God's law was in his heart, and he walked in this world. And those that saw him saw the glory of God and the glory of his righteous laws being worked out. Why were they stunned at his teaching? Why were they amazed at his life? Because his life was in harmony with the good God. Oh, how love I thy law, he could say with the psalmist, and he did. But he kept that law, which we've never kept perfectly, and died upon Calvary's cross that we might have everlasting life so that people that sin against God, that go their own way, might know forgiveness, pardon of sin, everlasting life. And this is why Paul could even say, having preached in Corinth, such were some of you. His mercy endureth forever. His grace extends to the foulest of sinners. We are all sinners in desperate need of that Savior. Let us cast ourselves upon him by faith. Amen. Thank you, Father, for these things. Help us to live in them and by them. Lord, help us to speak to our neighbors. Help us to understand the world we're living in to the best of our ability. Help us to realize, O oh Lord, that we're living in a day when we will have opportunities to speak the truth. And many of us have. And Father, I pray that we would, in every situation, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, loving the immortal souls of human beings, lost in any sin. And we pray that thou would set them free by thy gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Brethren, let's go in the name of the Lord Jesus.